So let me introduce um, a good friend, former classmate, and constant supporter uh, of me and of this program, and, uh, and a really good counselor, actually, in, um, uh, in my decision to come back here. Uh, it was largely um, based on, on conversations about Philly and what's happening in the culinary world and, and opportunities at Drexel and where I thought we could have impact. And um, I'm really uh, pleased um, that he came down to join us uh, to talk. Um, I'll do the official intro uh, now. Mitchell Davis is the executive vice president of the James Beard Foundation, a cookbook author, food journalist, and a scholar with a PhD in food studies from NYU. With the Beard Foundation for 20 years, Davis has created and overseen many of the organization's important activities, including the JBF Greens for foodies under 40, the foundation's popular five-week pop-up restaurant, JBF Limited and Chelsea Market, the JBF Annual Food Conference, a national dialogue of thought leaders on sustainability and public health in the food system, and the JBF Chef's Boot Camp for Policy and Change. In 2013, Davis assembled and led the team that was selected by the U.S. Department of State to create the USA Pavilion at the World Expo Milano 2015, the theme of which is American Food 2.0. In addition to his work at the foundation, Davis frequently writes about and reviews restaurants. He holds a chair on the Academy of the London-based World's 50 Best Restaurants Ranking Program. He's written four cookbooks, including The Mensch Chef and Kitchen Sense, co-authored the groundbreaking electronic book My Provence with famed chef Laurent Gras, which won two 2013 awards from the International Association of Culinary Professionals, including Judge's Choice, and he's a regular contributor to the art of eating. Davis's TV appearances include History Channel's 101 Fast Foods That Changed the World, Food Network's Photography, I'm almost done, Throwdown with Bobby Flay, and Best in Smoke. Davis is the host of Taste Matters, which I commend to you, uh, a weekly radio show Wednesdays at 11 a.m. on Heritage Radio Network. In 2013, the Forward selected Davis as one of the 50 most influential Jews under 50 in America. <laughs> I think that's a great way to end your bio, Mitchell. <laughs> but, you know, more than that, Mitchell is the person to talk to to know what's happening in food um, locally and nationally. He's the most keyed in person uh, to the food world I know. And he's a great resource uh, for our students and faculty and for everyone here. Um, so I'm really grateful that he um, was willing to come down and spend some time with us. Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you. That's a lot to live up to. Usually, I don't read those things before I send them, and I, I'll edit next time. Um, and I want to thank John and Mike and everybody here at Drexel, because um, I, I think we need to take a moment and consider how important something like this, convening a conference like this, can be for both for you who are working in the industry here in the city, but really for the whole culture of food in Philadelphia and beyond. I, I've been involved in several startup conferences, let's say, of chef and hospitality communities um, around the country, actually, in some other countries, too. And, and in a very short period of time, it isn't just great for you to get together and spend some time networking within your own community, which is uh, one of the, I'd say, probably the ultimate benefit, and to also learn and share from each other. But ultimately, the, the, um, the, the attention of the world comes onto a place where there's a dynamic community uh, internally, but, but internal things that, that show us sort of dynamism lead to, uh, well, just attract attention. And I, I've seen that, for instance, at the Terroir Conference in Toronto, which seven years ago no one knew why they were doing one, and this year uh, uh, practically every chef on the World's 50 Best list came to visit because something's happening there. And as you all know, something is very much happening in Philadelphia, and it sometimes just takes someone with a vision and an idea like John to kick it up a little bit. And so I would encourage you to come back next year. I would encourage you to participate if there's opportunities um, to work on a steering committee, to communicate back and forth with what you feel you need, and to also reach out outside the community to bring people in uh, and show them the great time that I know that you can. It's a really important piece of cohering um, the Philadelphia food scene, which is, as you all know better than I, has exploded tremendously. I'm... Uh, 
John asked me to talk a little bit about trends, but I'm going to leave that to the experts. I heard a lot of uh, things uh, in the day. I was here today. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here yesterday. But even in the talk about what happened yesterday, I heard so much um, uh, really great practical stuff from food trucks to charcuterie and all the sorts of wonderful things going on. There was a real sharing of information. And I, I want to take um, 10,000 feet back a step 10,000 feet back. And I want to look at why, why things like this, why trends, why taste are really important and, and sort of empower you a little bit to think, um, I would say, expansively, maybe globally, about the role, the work that you do on your day-to-day, got to get dinner out, got to order for lunch tomorrow, lives, and, and fit that into some, some larger things moving around. Um, and I hope to do that in 45 minutes so I can leave some time for questions. And they can be questions about what I'm talking about, or you can ignore completely what I'm talking about and ask me questions about other things. That's fine. So, and I'm going to start, I, I've called it the making of taste because I want to, uh, I want to, um, I want to propose that we consider ourselves taste makers. And obviously we do that in a very practical way. We cook things that taste good, Many, some of us, some of us, whatever. It's a personal thing, which we'll talk about. Um, uh, but also because I think that there is a power in taste and in flavor, especially in questions concerning food that is unexplored, I would say, or is often dismissed for various reasons. And we're going to start and talk about tastes and trends and power, and there's something else up there, flavor, um, and you guys. Shall, I'll presume you're all chefs, although I know that you are all not, but you're all somehow related to the chef and food community. Um, and I'm going to start by juxtaposing two things. Maybe I'm not. Whoops. Um, so taste and politics. And increasingly at the Beard Foundation, as, as John mentioned in my lengthy bio, uh, we started a, uh, five years ago, we started a conference of, th of thought leaders in the food space. Um, and these are people who work across an incredible array an uh, incredible array of professions from running giant multinational companies to setting policy in Washington or setting policy locally to operating tiny little farms or running a food truck and everything in between. And, and one of the things that was clear and the reason that we intended to do it was we wanted to bring together this community of people working on some really big uh, food system issues but we wanted to infuse those conversations that had been happening uh, for a long time um, with the notion that there's a value to the taste, that actually the pleasure of food, I'll use taste as a surrogate for that, the pleasure and enjoyment of food is as much a part of those conversations or ought to be um, as anything. And in some ways, the intent was to politicize taste um, and not just talk about sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami and whatever other tastes that are coming down the pike that we're going to learn about um, in the coming years um, as as ways for individuals to enjoy pleasure, but actually as ways, I think, to um, inspire change. Um, and, you know, there, if you equate voting with flavor, as some, only I would suppose one might want to do, um, when you like something, obviously, you are, you are asserting a preference for it. And when you vote for something, you're doing the same thing. And there is an act of the individual in the global community, I think, that is really important. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because it is a big trend we're seeing um, at the foundation. Uh, I'm going to talk about the power of taste, and, and in some ways, as a vote, you either like something or you don't like something. Both, by the way, my slides are just illustrative. I actually have no information you need to, to write down or think or bullet points. I'm not that kind of presenter. Um, so that if, if I say something you disagree with, you'll, I'll forget it by the end and I'll change my mind. Um, there's no record. But, but I thought that this... I, in this instance, because it's such a personal thing, unlike voting, taste is often dismissed, or, or food preferences are often dismissed as unimportant, or maybe not unimportant, but frivolous, or, or manipulatable, or, you know, we've been reading lately Michael Moss's work about how the fast food industry knows our minds and our palates better than we do and can manipulate the, the density of a potato chip, so we want another bag of them, and all those sorts of things. So, so taste is used in that way. But actually, um, not so much in the way of creating a culture, um, decisions and behaviors based on values that we share that could move things as respectful um, food consumers and members of a food community to different places that we might want to go. And I'll talk a little bit about that farther on. There's also a, a power of politics, I think, uh, in trends and taste. I'll, I'll, I'll use a construction that Adam Gopnik, who's the great uh, New, York, New Yorker writer, uses, which is that tastes are important because they lead to trends, and trends lead to behaviors, and behaviors are what cause change. Um, we sort of all live in a world that is directed by our behaviors. We buy things, we, we don't do things, we watch things, all sorts of stuff based on our behaviors. And so there is a power in going from the personal to the communal that is really fundamental, I think, in, in participating in a society, and in this instance, we're talking about a food society. 
Um, is there anyone who does not know what the thing on the right is, or your, I guess your left? Uh, that is a, you do not know, that is a cronut. Have you heard of the word cronut? No. So most people in this world, the cronut is a Franken pastry, people will call it. That is a mashup of the croissant and the donut that Dominique Ancel at a little bakery in Soho created and trademarked and has become a sensation that was only introduced on May 10th of this year, or I guess it's last year now. Uh, and by June 6th, when I landed in Tokyo, um, the, in the Depachika, the underground uh, gourmet shops of the, under, uh, the Mitsukoshi department store, they were selling cronuts in Tokyo in two weeks. And it is a trend that has exploded around the world for all sorts of reasons, partly, and we'll talk a little bit about them, partly because it can. We live in a moment where someone eats something, takes a picture, tweets it, suddenly, if it catches fire, let's say, it's a global phenomenon, and the cronut, I mean, for weeks it was the trending word on Twitter. You know, people who will never step foot in Soho, certainly not in Dominique Ancel's bakery, where they still wait for three hours in the morning for him to sell 120 cronuts because he had, it's a laminated dough and it's a real pain in the ass to make and he can't do that many and he actually doesn't want to do any more because he's, he's a real pastry chef and not a, not a not someone who just makes one thing, blah, 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 on and on and on. But I think it's a very modern phenomenon, even though in some ways it's a very old-fashioned uh, dessert. It takes a lot of effort. There's a lot of butter in it. Yes, it's deep fried, but then it's stuffed with a pastry cream and glazed, and he does really beautiful things with it. So I think it's a way uh, to understand one sort of trend. Next to it, you, uh, we all know that. That's an old-fashioned thing. That's not a new thing. That's kale. That is kale, which, you know, who thought we would ever live long enough kale be the trendiest vegetable on earth where you can, I mean, create whole industries of kale chips and kale salads. And I mean, I, I liken it when I first moved to New York, every, people used to make fun because every menu had tuna tartare and um, creme brulee and a molten chocolate cake, thanks to all of the people who create, brought those things to New York. But now every menu, every food truck, every fast food place has a kale salad on it and a kale thing. And I love kale. And a lot of things, I think, happen to, to lead us to that place. Um, obviously, there's this notion that it's good for us, although there was just a great, I think, when we'll talk about trends a little bit later and the way trends work, a great article in the Times magazine, uh, an op-ed of some woman who thought she was eating all the right foods and drank a, a cup of kale juice every day and found out it was killing her or something, which I love. It's, you know, it's been around long enough that you can write that article and get that printed in the New York Times. Um, but also, I think kale as a trend represents something very different. It's, it sort of speaks to farm to table. It's come out of the organic food movement. I think it actually has a lot to do with the introduction of lachinado kale, or what would be normally called cavalonero from Tuscany, the black cabbage there, and which is a little more palatable, uh, uh, raw, certainly, uh, but, but just the idea that we would live in a kale frenzy moment is insane to me. But I also think speaks to this moment and is not unlike the notion of the cronut, although they stand for very different things and rep represent, I think, very different um, ways that food can um, work through the system. Um, so in case you think I'm lying about kale, I don't know if you saw this New York Times piece where they try to find a counter argument for broccoli with a bunch of great... Um, uh, great thinking, advertising, and marketing people, and they decided to create a campaign uh, to call broccoli the new kale. <laughs> okay, so we're we're in that that we're in that phase of kale's popularity, which I just think is great to think about ways that you can you can transform our behaviors, change our taste, transform our behaviors, um, and really have an impact on how food is grown, where it's produced, what we consume, the, our health, all that kind of stuff. And in case you think, I mean, this was just folly for an article that Michael Moss orchestrated and Sarah Brito kind of coordinated, who's a, a, a marketing person. But um, if you're familiar with the baby carrot, which we are all familiar, which was an invention of a company that is now called, um, oh, the name just left my mind, even though I know it so well. Anyway, it's the largest company in California. They're the largest producers of carrots and baby carrots in California. Did someone Bolt, say? Bolt, Bolt, Bolt House Farms, yes. Bolt, thank you. Um, and Jeff Dunn, who's the CEO of Bolt House Farms now, who came from uh, running Coca-Cola, and who came, had a sort of awakening of his spirit um, on a trip to Brazil when he was walking around as the CEO of Coca-Cola North America, looking for market opportunities, realizing to himself that the last people, thing on earth these people needed was Coca-Cola, um, shifted gears and brought what he knew about food and marketing to Bolt House Farms. Um, and you may have seen them, and if you didn't, you should go online and watch the YouTube videos of the commercials that he did for carrots, which, which take every kind of genre you could imagine of a subculture, whether it's sci-fi or, um, I can't even imagine that many, that's how untapped in I am, but, but there, and, and did commercials for them to get kids interested in treating them like torpedoes and, and guns and all these sorts of things, and it was all about marketing carrots. So this, this idea comes really strong, and, and I think also reflects the, the, the economic power of some of these decisions and behaviors and trends. 
Um, well, I should have shown that first. I, I heard some people today in panels uh, dismiss the idea of farm to table, which I think is, of course, it, where else does food come if not from the farm, and where else does it go if not on the table? And that I, I couldn't agree with you more. But but the fact that we're in a moment uh, where farm to table is such a trend, and, and many will say it's already out, and I'm already seeing people, I'm already seeing chefs in interviews dismiss the idea that they cook farm to table and just say they look for the best things wherever they come from. Like that's already percolating up just as, as the kale juice will kill me article is coming up. You know a trend's jump the shark or whatever um, when you start to see all the backlash. Um, but the idea of farm to table is a trend that is, you know, uh, 40 years and overnight in the making and perhaps all of humanity in the making, this idea that we grow food, we cook it and we serve it and can only resonate in a time when people have moved away from the idea that food was something that was grown and consumed near where we ate. And, and sometimes, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, I have a slide of Escoffier because I, I think we forget that only... Well, is the notion of growing food in a locality and serving that at a restaurant is a very modern concept because restaurants were places, that's what you did when you ate. That was eating was growing food and eating food from a locality. Restaurants were places where you brought food from exotic places, where it was flown in from around the world, modeled on what the kings or the nobility of France ate, and they were stuff that did not grow there. There was no interest in serving anything that grew there because what grew there is what everyone ate. So you can only have farm to table resonate in a moment as a trend when that's no, no longer true. And I think it's important to keep those contexts, historical, cultural, in mind when we think about the power of trends. Because they tell us things that are not about what they, those trends are, but about what the environment is in which they are happening. All of this, of course, let's, let's call the environment the food system. Um, there are a thousand ways to depict it. I could have chosen from 1,700 uh, um, uh, illustrations of the food system. We're talking about Production generally, the farm, but um, also other ways that food, you know, we're spending a lot of time because of the Expo project, which I'll talk a little bit about, thinking about the future of food. And a lot of people believe the future of food has very little to do with traditional farms with, with plants and soil, and there are vertical farms, and there's meat grown in Petri dishes by Google, and all these sorts of things going on. But let's say some form of production, some form of processing that food these days, because of how big we are and how many people, has to go from the farm to someplace else, and then it has to be distributed. And a lot of People are working um, in the social um, the social workspace, the, the sort of nonprofit world, to try to figure out the distribution problems because you either believe we will not have enough food for the future, or you believe we have plenty of food and we just can't get it to the right people, and we have things like food access problems and food deserts and all that sort of stuff. But each of these has its own um, opportunity. Uh, I think for change. Consumers obviously is where the taste and behavior change happens, but, but it's very closely tied. If you talk to people at gi giant companies, they will say, oh, we can't charge another penny for a can of um, tomatoes that are marketed to be sustainably grown. And I've heard this from you know, giant companies like Unile Unilever produces one of the largest food companies in the world. Also, it ha just so happens one of the most sustainably minded food companies in the world, working really hard to make all of their uh, one million farmers um, certified in some way for sustainability. But at Unilever, they believe that if they, they, they can't charge another penny if they say this is sustainably grown on the menu of a can of tomatoes or their Hellman's mayonnaise or all the sorts of things because they think the consumers won't, won't, don't really care. They're doing it for business reasons. They need to sustain as much food as you need for a giant global food company. And to do that, they have to stop depleting the earth of resources and, and find a way to maintain a balance. Anyway, regardless, so the consumers can change their behavior. And then increasingly, the waste side and uh, food waste management Management is after consumption, but also along this whole chain, so much food is wasted, estimates are like 30 or 40 percent. I'm not here to tell you you should be engaged in all these things and go out and be sustainable chefs, but, but this is the system that, that most people imagine happening to create some of the food situations we're in and where trends percolate and change. It's often a system in which taste is left out, even, even if it comes to that little consumer thing. Um, we're just supposed to, this system is supposed to make enough food for us, or, you know, and get it to enough people, and it doesn't, we should all be happy, it doesn't matter how it tastes or how it's cooked or whatever necessarily, as long as it's healthy and as long as it's wholesome, whatever that means. Um, and so I would argue that actually a way to get people to engage in this is to focus on flavor, to focus on the qualities of food that are lost when you deal with all these other issues, and we'll talk a little bit about that. 
But superimposed on top of this food system is something, and I think um, John will laugh because this is from my doctoral research and it's gonna remind him he'll probably have PTSD um, things, is what I'm calling the trend system. And there's no need to pay that much attention to what's happening inside this little diagram, but this is based on a French sociologist work who's the most obtuse writer. I would never recommend anyone read it. I spent four years trying to figure it out. But really what he's doing, um, see he's already he's squeaming, he's squirming in his t ch chair. Um, really what I, I use it to show is that actually the decisions that are superimposed on the food system happen on this, this notion of trend system. This is where being a tastemaker, being a celebrity, being a thought leader, being a professor, being a chef increasingly in these days, which has a power to influence taste and trends and behavior, um, works out and has an impact on how we eat. So what we're trying to graph here, what, what Pierre Bourdieu suggested, not in food so much, but in other areas of cultural production, the arts, theater, um, literature, the sorts of things, were that people with a certain um, social capital, you may have heard that word, he coined that phrase, with a certain um, influence because of their upbringing because of their education, because of their station in life, because of anything, it, you know, it's all relative, so it doesn't matter, can make decisions about what people eat, do, or keep, eat, or cook, or what's valuable in a moment that changes the whole playing field, that suddenly, suddenly, because... Well, because everyone is doing kale, someone is going to do broccoli. Because every some some and and when that someone doing broccoli is Jose Garces, uh, that becomes an important moment, and suddenly broccoli has a moment, you know. Um, or it, everyone's doing farm to table. Uh, you know, I'm actually importing caviar from the the Caspian Sea again because why not? Because no one else has it. These sorts of things. I mean, obviously, there's a lot that happens, but there's this notion that decisions change the the environment. I would call this a graph of the environment, the cultural environment of trends. Um, and the super, but superimposing the tr this trend system on what I call this food system, I think, is where we find our power as a community, as chefs, um, to really Im uh, impact change. And th that's change that could just be um, one thing we're all fighting for, an appreciation of our clientele for the extra effort we go to make something delicious. You know, that every, every can of beans opened is not the same as the beans that I just were, were sort of heirloom harvested and, and cooked overnight in my oven. Or, you know, that, that there are distinctions and there's value in those distinctions. And not just value in those distinctions, but those distinctions are just not about keeping people separate. They're not just about um, affluence or access or elitism, which is one of the challenges we face all the time in the food community at the Beard Foundation. Oh, you guys must be food snobs. Actually, we think everyone's food should be better, not just rich people's food or not just, you know, our diners and the restaurant's food. We think everyone's food should be better and we'd all be better off. And to find ways to make that possible is, is sort of what I'll challenge all of you to do, that, that not just better for the person who can afford a $30 chicken, but that all the, the, the bad chicken you buy can't be as bad as the chicken that is out there. And things like this, I think, are the important role that all of us as a community can have in these larger societal global food problems. Enough of that. I'm going to make an example. I'm here in my hometown. Does anyone know which of the sandwiches this one is? Just by looking at it, I wondered if anyone would know. I mean, Geno's. I heard Geno's. I've heard it's Geno's. I, I mean, that's what it said when I stole it from the internet. Um, but, but, oh, okay. Well, there you go. See, no one, they, the internet lied. Don't believe anything you steal from the internet. This is a lesson to the students in the room. It's, someone will find you out. Anyway, um, so... So obviously, you know, you can argue there needs to be cheese whiz or not or all the sorts of things that you can argue about a, about a cheesesteak, but, but it hasn't changed. The environment around it has changed. And, and when I started coming to Philadelphia 20 years ago or even a little bit longer than that to eat, I couldn't even find a food writer to take me to a cheesesteak. They were so... Um, not proud, so wanting to pretend they didn't exist, you know, so we are so beyond that. Like, literally, it took three trips for me to finally just get in a cab and go myself, which I was also advised never to go where Pat's and Gino's are, or whatever, all that sort of stuff. I mean, maybe it was true then. Um, but, but today, you know, post Food Network, post Guy Fieri, post everybody, I mean, you know, outside, basically, lunch today was ultimately a cheesesteak. I mean, it wasn't. Obviously, the, the ingredients are better than things, but the phenomenon that le has led us to the food truck trend is, is is related to this sandwich in, in many, many ways, and a celebration of this type of eating and a democratization of, of attention paid to food and connoisseurship, um, and I think is a really powerful and important change. Um, this is a modern food. This is, a, this is actually a Philly, on a menu as a Philly cheesesteak. Has anyone had this? At the Bazaar, uh, um, Jose Andres' wonderful restaurant in Los Angeles. It's sold as the Philly cheesesteak. And he's one of the great, Span you know, comes out of the line of the great Spanish modernist cooks. And it is um, a cheese, a spoon. 
Fuma, because of course everything Spanish and modernist has to have a foam on it of some kind. Um, it's a, an air puff filled with cheese, espuma, and a, a paper thin slice of Wagyu beef on it. And it's really, pardon my French, fucking delicious, um, actually. As I would say is, is Gino's or Oliveri's cheesesteak. But obviously this represents something very different. It's the same thing, it's the same idea, it's, but it has a different resonance. And, and in fact, I would say this sort of thing is, is rising in popularity because of the, the interest in, in the refound interest in the cheesesteak. So I'm really just trying to plant these ideas of transformations of, of the power of these sorts of changes and what, what they do. Because part of what serving something like this does to the Hollywood crowd in LA is it makes a city like Philadelphia proud of Pats and Gino's. Like there's, there's, it creates a history, it draws a line in some way, um, a, a pride in culture. And pride is actually a really important thing that some of these um, conferences are important and something I, one day, in, if I ever return to academic work, would like to find a way to quantify because I actually think when you look at all the great food cultures around, food city cultures around the world, one of the, the common denominators is a sense of pride in what is happening there. And, I, and that's hard, it's certainly hard in a city um, like Philadelphia, which is, uh, obviously has its own identity and its own community, but so close to a really big neighbor um, where, where I live. Um, in fact, you know, it's, it's funny to drive around in the cab because uh, there's a lot of New York here now in, in a lot of ways, but, but to find an identity and a pride in what's here, unique to here, not in relationship to what's everywhere else is not easy, but it's a really important part, I think, in, in um, inspiring a community to, to strive and to, to, um, to um, aspire. Um, and so that's part of this trend. Part of it is just fun. Part of it is to make something fancy and charge a lot of money for it and to tap into all sorts of things. But, but these are just different ways that, that trends, I think, articulate themselves. And this is Auguste Escoffier, because we're in a, ultimately a culinary school. I thought it was appropriate to show a picture of him, the, one, the, the chef of kings, the king of chefs, one of the, the person who codified French cuisine. I mean, we laugh. You laugh if you read about him historically. He simplified French cuisine. What we know as the most complicated French cuisine is his. But it before was Karem, and then it was even more complicated. But one of the things that I think is interesting when you look at the historical Escoffier, not just the body of work that he left, um, is he was very political. He felt he felt most of his life he felt he simplified French food to improve the role of the chef, the life of the chef, which if you think you've got it bad, and I know it's you know, the part they leave out of most TV shows is it's the hardest job there is to cook still, um, but but in those days, before refrigeration, coal, uh, wood-fired ovens, basements, no ventilation, industrial cities, I mean, imagine what the, the life was like. And so to simplify um, cuisine also meant to simplify the life of a chef. And so there's obviously a political, social um, nature uh, or root to that desire. But also, he, he outright says in his bi uh, biography, at the, at the end of his, not his biography, his memoir, in his own words, he says how proud he is to have installed 2,000 French chefs in restaurants around the world um, who will celebrate um, the traditions of French cuisine, use French products, um, stimulate the economy is that that is a euphemism for um, and contribute to what we then we think of as French cuisine as this sort of hegemony of French cuisine in the world of cultural um, relevance of food. So yes, you can argue we're breaking away. Of, you know, maybe Spain took it over. Maybe it's in Denmark now. With all this sort of stuff. But whenever we're talking about food and restaurants and chefs in the Western world, we are generally referring back to France and to this time of Escoffier spreading the French chefs around, either in reaction to or in celebration of. And we're probably due, I would say, for a celebration of. And I, I would not be surprised because I know I hear chefs talking about. Wouldn't it be great if we opened a restaurant that sold canel, sold canel de brochet, sauce nantua, and all these sorts of things that we forget the the flavors of them will soon resonate um, right alongside kimchi tacos and, and all the other stuff. Anyway, so I think it's important to remember that, that, that he was not just a, a gastronomic figure, but also um, a political figure. Uh, he also, by the way, had influence in, in very high politics, the dinner of the three emperors where uh, Tsar Nikolai and, uh, and Napoleon and uh, uh, Wilhelm of, of, of Austria, like, he was part of that discourse. So, so there is some, some real thought leadership there. To say that taste is, is, uh, is powerful is one thing and an abstract thing, but I actually have an example that I'm increasingly thinking about, about the way that it actually can be used as a tool. And does anyone recognize what this is? This is the UC Davis flavor wheel for wine. Yeah, it actually takes different forms. It was more round. I've, I've seen different examples of it. So it's a way to relate 
um, the flavors of wine to different characteristics in the grapes and in the vinification of those grapes and all sorts of stuff. Um, but what really I think it is as a cultural phenomenon is a way, uh, is a, a tool for connoisseurship and education and, and I would say, um, to, to, to refer to back to that, that trend system as a way to separate people who have this knowledge and this appreciation from something else. But it's also a powerful tool. The idea of identifying the differences of flavors of things is a, can be a powerful tool, I will propose to you, um, to counteract one of the biggest ills at the source of the food system problems we have, and that's the commodification of food. So if you think of, of one of the challenges of our food system is, is um, the type of farming, the type of production, the commodification of food to make it all the same so it trades freely on an open market, and there are many examples of this happening. It happens in commodity beef, so that everyone who, we have no idea where the, what the cows are, where they came from, we're just trying to make them all the same so that we can trade them in an open, fair, unregulated market, which is at the root of our our society as a positive thing, no, no editorializing there, or um, coffee, which this is a picture of coffee in Rwanda going to the commodity market. Doesn't matter if it's from Rwanda, as long as it's well made and well produced. We don't know what trees they were. We don't necessarily know whatever. Um, true of wheat, true of soybeans, true of also cotton, which we don't eat, but actually is an agricultural product that has a big impact on food. On food. And in fact, I learned just the other day that um, cotton seeds are really high in oil, and so they grind them up and feed them to chickens and animals, actually, to make the, it's a good use for cotton seeds, so it is directly put into food. Um, and this commodification requires the, the leveling out of all of the ingredients. Basically, we're making widgets and we're selling widgets. And if you think of a, a counter um, tool or, or some way to counteract that process as this discernment of flavor, this distinction of uh, like the wine wheel, that maybe if maybe we could add value to things by separating the flavors, by identifying different things, by saying this coffee from this place is one thing, which of course we live in the moment, this is par part of La Colombe, since we're local here, selection, it has happened in coffee, where we've decided to not say that all coffee is the same and come under the brand Folgers or Maxwell House, although Honestly, most coffee in the world still goes that way, but they're finding it harder and harder and harder to find enough coffee it, to go into that system because of this other, this other change. So if we could celebrate where they're from, if we could work with people to make them different, if we could find ways to process the coffee the same but to have a different result and identify them and add value in the consumer's market, create a trend for coffee, create some notion of connoisseurship, then taste is the tool to do that. I was recently part... Um, a few months ago of something, saying it still makes me laugh. I was at a sustainable meat hackathon in Silicon Valley, of course. And by hackathon, they didn't mean butchering, although there was some butchering that happened as a demonstration. They meant um, the Silicon Valley tech minds trying to figure out a way to get more people to eat sustainable meat using technology tools. We were at the Stanford School of Design. And at that hackathon, what people were doing, were we were presented with challenges about why pe more people won't um, don't eat um, sustainable meat. And there's the obvious, there isn't enough of it. But then there's the chef's thing, it reacts differently, it isn't consistent, I don't know, my cooks don't know how to cook it, you have to handle it differently. Then there's the consumer thing, ah, it doesn't taste like the steaks I, I remember and spend a lot, it's not dry age, it doesn't have as much fat, all these sorts of things. And our proposition as, a, as an organization to participate in that hackathon was to say, maybe we could find a way to celebrate the differences in flavors of meat so that we don't want, so that, that we don't, Want, we don't only pay the most for the dry 28 day, 36 ounce dry aged porterhouse steak that is in a, in a steakhouse, which is basically commodity beef handled well and well raised, but, but it's a flavor of aging, which, and maybe we could find a way to highlight the differences in the tastes of meats and cuts and how it's raised and wh what grass it ate and whether it was spring meat or winter meat, some way to get people to engage with the differences and then find, um, sort of create an environment where those things are celebrated and not just dismissed as not good meat. So there's not just two categories, but 100 categories. Ideally, creating the flavor wheel for meat, um, as has been done with coffee, as has been done with wine, to counteract the commodification of beef. I mean, it's just an idea, but it's the idea of using taste as a tool. And we, who knows about taste more than people like us in this room who consume and cook with and flavor and season things more than anything um, all day long. Um, I would propose for you, this is, this is my friend Valentina, 
Valentina is a farmer, and I'm, I'm, the, I say the word not pejoratively, she is a peasant farmer in Tuscany. She would be very proud to be called that. She is the 14th generation farm, the last farm, her family has the last farmland within the city limits of Florence. So you can imagine, I mean, they, they kind of live in a shack, they pick the, they've lost all of their, I don't know that, honestly, I don't know that they ever own their land. They were probably part of what is called a Meta Adria system, which was um, operative in Tuscany right up until the late 60s, with basically sharecropping, where the peasants worked the land, they gave some money to the people who owned it, and then they ate off of it. So I don't know that they ever own their land because it's increasingly over the generations been taken away from them. Uh, but they still have arugula, all these things that she's growing there are grown on their land in the city of Tuscany, cannellini beans, cavalonero certainly in winter, all that sort of stuff. And the thing that, the reason I use this picture of Valentina is every year I taught for NYU in Florence uh, for 10 consecutive summers, uh, a, a class, a master's class on food uh, culture and nutrition in Italy. And one of the things that was remarkable is um, th those students were taken and entertained by, uh, you know, literally former kings and dukes and duchies or whatever on their, their wine estates in Chianti and served a beautiful lunch of tomatoes and house cured that they grew and house cured uh, prosciutto and olive oil that they pressed themselves and all these sorts of uh, idyllic Italian, Tuscan, particularly products. And Valentina and her, aunt, uh, her mother, who... Um, you know, is not actually an advertisement for the Mediterranean diet at 490 pounds who can't really get up, and her brother and whatever would have our students over also every time to their, their house in a very proud way. And what was remarkable, in addition to it being, you know, like thinking about it makes me tear up because they were just such amazing people without a penny who would never take any money, even though I kept saying it's NYU's money, take the money, they wouldn't take any money. <laughs> and I'm talking 30 students for dinner, is they served us the exact same meal. We ate Tomatoes they grew, olive oil they pressed, hams they cured from their own um, uh, wild boars that they caught, pasta, like it was the same meal whether you, we were with the nobility or we were with the peasants. And to me it was an indication, a very profound indication of what a different uh, food culture might look like where, where the best food wasn't reserved for people who had the money or the access, but the system produced good food and Everyone was entitled to it. Eating that food made her makes their family Tuscan. It, it's not. It's not about they deserve it or they should be happy with it. It is. It is who they are in a very profound way. And and the. I mean, it was a very remarkable moment to point that out. And and when I tell you, it was an incredible meal in both of those places. And it was really the same meal. Um, and I thought, well, there are visions, I guess, of of better chickens for everyone, not just for you know people who can pay twenty dollars a pound for chicken. And there is there is a model, I think that we can imagine together, that's certainly something we'd all want to operate in, where the choices that we have are all good. Some might be better, different, whatever, but actually the wholesomeness is not the problem, but the system produces wholesome food, and so the options are better. You know, uh, I don't have the answer. I don't ha know how we get from A to B, but there, but there are some models. And you could do a similar thing in, Ch in Japan, for instance, um, in a very different way. Um, but, a, but a food culture where what you consume in the connoisseurship isn't about separating people, but it's about celebrating artisanship. It's about, it's about understanding um, deeply the food, the things that we care about, um, and that people have access to them to the extent that they, they can participate, um, none, all the same. So we have the food system, we have the trend system, or we have a policy system or a political system or whatever. You know, again, lots of ways to depict it. Um, the thing that has become really um, amazing to me and, and one of the trends that I think will prove to be the most profound is, is you guys, and by you guys I mean people in the chef and hospitality community, using this opportunity you have because everyone loves to talk about what you do and the pe people become famous and you're invited to different situations and gatherings, not just to cook but actually to sit down, to influence this system that, that that your experience is finally at a point that, um, uh, with food is at a point where, and, and I would say the general interest in food is at a point where you are being asked to contribute to these things. And as an organization of the Beard Foundation, we're trying to facilitate that a little bit. Um, not, to, not to say we have a vision of what things should be, but to help you guys. I'll talk a little bit more about that, figure out yours and, and play, but, but it's much easier from a position, if you think about um, that, that trend system, a position of social capital, which food and chefs increasingly have, uh, to influence change, and programs at a university like this help um, s build that social capital um, as they change, gatherings like this, uh, the people who come into your restaurant, the, the, the things people see on TV, the way the way people interact with food, it actually does fit into this amazingly. Um, we were told by the Pew uh, Charitable Trust Center for Research and whatever in public policy, um, that if they go to Washington, they're based in Washington, if they go to the Hill, no one takes their calls. If they say they're bringing three chefs, 
they all get to see everybody. And, I, and I, I'm not sure that this will last forever, honestly, like all things, it's a trend and it changes, but, but now is the moment to do something with that while we're in it. And, and what you do with it, you know, it may be about food, it may not be about food. Um, I do think it, but I do think we have a responsibility as, as, as citizens and leaders in our community to do something with it. Uh, that's James Beard. Does anyone really know who he was? Raise your hand if you have an idea of who he was. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I didn't, I mean, I can answer more questions. I didn't want to spend too much time. I mean, I'm not sure. I, well, I do believe that who we've made him was in who he was, but he's become, in some ways, a, a, even a, a more, a broader figure today because of the foundation than he was in his life because everyone was in a different situation then vis-a-vis -vis food. And so he was born in Oregon in 1903. He died in New York City in 1985. Um, and throughout that time, reluctantly, he became a food writer. And I say reluctantly because he wanted to be an actor like most people in the restaurant business and, uh, or a singer on Broadway or whatever. And and that didn't really work out. Anyway, he was also the first, uh, he was on television in 1945, um, which television was nine months old at the time. Uh, and then he had his own show in 1946, and he was horrible on television, actually. Uh, but they didn't really care. It's anyone who could, they, they could put on. I've heard TV people say um, they would throw up and see what sticks um, on the wall. And if you read the Food Network, uh, biography that's just out called From Scratch, which I would actually, against my, my initial reaction, I would encourage you all to read because it's a great story of food in our time. And it's not as sensationalized as the network itself, but really walks you through how it happened and the business of television. And what was remarkable to me is nothing that was written about in the Food Network 20 years ago seemed different from 1945 when they threw James Beard. Like no one really knows what's gonna work or what's gonna stick. And when something does, you run it out as long as you possibly possibly can, and then something else comes, and sorry, Emeril, your show is canceled. And he still can't believe it, apparently, if you read this book. But, but it's a really, I, it was a page turner. I read it at a weekend, I couldn't, I could not put it down. Uh, and it's a real snapshot from a different perspective of the last 20 years of food, which has made today possible, really. Uh, Anyway, so Beard was around, and he was, I mean, we, we, he was called the Dean of American Cookery in 1957 by the Times, and that, I think that's a really good point about what he was, because he had this interesting perspective where he, trend, um, he sort of transversed pre-industrialization of food and post. His, in Oregon, his mother was a great cook, and had, they had a Chinese cook in a boarding house, and they would buy fish from the docks, and they, they had this really sort of um, idyllic food existence, at least how, as, it's, as it's recorded. Uh, and then he also you know, witnessed, he goes and he wrote this letter to a friend in 1952 after coming back from the restaurant show in New York, and it, what made me laugh was, I, you could write the letter today, he can't believe what they're doing to food, and how they've, 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 they've frozen this, and the stuff that, and the poppers, blah, 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 and what are they going to do? It hasn't really changed. So those things have been going on for a long time. And he really laid down some principles that I think have become uniquely American, that things should be accessible. His favorite, one of his favorite things, he loved French food, and he was feted by the great chefs of France, but a big bowl of red was, was what he considered the iconic American dish, and a bowl, he meant a bowl of chili, um, was as happy eating that as anything. And I think his accessibility, his openness, his, his outsized appetite, uh, and his his, um, his approach, his first book was called How to Boil, well, no, it's second book, his first cookbook, um, it's called How to Boil Water, and he began, take a pot, fill it with water, put it on the stove, and turn it on. Like, that, that approach, I think, really laid the groundwork for what would become a unique American attitude about food. Um, and anyway, so he died, and the organization started after him, and one, I mean, it's, a, it's funny to look back, I've been there 20 years now, um, and I guess we're 27 or 28 years old, um, and to look back and just realize that no one had knew what was going to hit them. Like the pictures when you see at the first Beard Awards in 91, like Danielle Ballou looks like a kid and he, you know, sure he has aspirations of what a chef could do, but no one would imagine what is possible today for, you know, to be, to, to be part of this, um, this movement, this, this really important uh, moment in food. Anyway, um, so a few years ago, sort of recognizing some of these trends that I've been talking about, especially this one of the social engagement, um, we decided that we'd use our power to bring people together. And I, I believe, we still don't totally understand that power, but we know it is true and it works, that, that when we invite people as the Beard Foundation, they show up, even people you wouldn't expect, and we just have to assume they think the food's going to be good, because we don't know why else, honestly. Uh, but as an organization, we're taking the opportunity 
scarcity of that power um, to bring these different people to the table and insert this idea of taste and food and the pleasure of food and access and fairness and wholesomeness of our food system into those conversations. And we started, um, this is sort of the cycle of how we see it. We started with the JBF Food Conference, which we refer to among ourselves as the Davos of Food, and is increasingly becoming that kind of thing. It happens in the fall. Um, we, we get, as I said, the White House is there, um, titans of industry are there, and farmers and NGOs and all sorts of people. It's very diverse. You know, it's a growing, um, evolving thing. Um, we started the Chefs Bootcamp for Policy and Change, which was in my bio, where we take uh, a very diverse group of chefs equally from around the country, sometimes from key congressional districts. We take them away. We train them in, in advocacy skills and media skills, not to give them a, a – not to – give them the, their opinions, but to give them some tools that might help them be articulate and go back into their communities and, and lead to do things like this, to participate in conferences, to hold their own salons, um, which are smaller gatherings. Um, Chef Action Network is a, is a support mechanism we help create. So if someone asks you to do something, they can help um, do research, they can do administrative. It's a separate organization, but we're sort of the funders and the, the, brain, the, the inspiration behind it. And then chefs who are working. I mean, this is a sphere of influence that would not be imaginable. I mean, I think Escoffier participated in this sphere, but I, I think when you know the first graduates in the 70s who were all excited about American cuisine from the CIA, let's to, to pull one out of the air, had no idea that they might have a role in some of this po policy system, as I called it. Um, and I think it's a really profound and important change. This is our first class at Blackberry Farm of chefs, and some of them you know, Hugh Atchison, and maybe and uh, Sean Brock are there, but some of them you don't know, Phil Jones from Detroit, lots of people. Uh, and we're trying, I mean, the, we, we handpicked these people as a pilot to see if they, there would be interest, and of course, uh, clearly they came, but then when the word got out, we started an application process, and I would encourage you, if you're interested, to go to jamesbeard.org and find under the Chef tab um, application process, and I think we have 450 applicants, and we can only do 12 or 15 people once or twice a year, so we've got some work to do. But again, the point is not really to touch everyone, but to touch some people who are going to touch a lot of people and use the, the sort of power of the exponents of people's networks um, to help. All of this stuff has led us into a funny situation, and I didn't put a slide in here, of we, we have a new relationship with the State Department, which is another thing that could not have imagined, I don't think, James, uh, by James Beard. Um, and the U.S. State Department is obviously um, charged with all the diplomatic um, operations of the country, good and bad. I'm sure there's things I'll never know and don't care to know going on. Um, but we created something called the American Chef Corps, which is uh, right now 220 chefs are identified as ambassadors who, when they are traveling around the world, represent America and obviously the food inter interests. But it was Hillary Clinton's idea that there was a, so a form of soft um, uh, diplomacy or soft power um, that we could just bring people to the table and, and engage them in these conversations. And that has led us into a totally... Uh, new world, which is um, the next World's Fair, as John mentioned in my bio. For the, so the World's the Expo is now what we call World's Fairs. And most people, if they remember anything, they remember uh, 64 in New York, which is where everyone had their first Belgian waffle in America, an important food moment. But you know, if you go back to 1906 in Chicago, so, no, 18, 1896. 1896, Chicago and the ice cream and the ice cream cone in St. Louis in 1904, or something, whatever, important things, these expos one day. They don't resonate so much here in, in America these days, but they go on every five years. And they are huge operations, the way the Olympics work. And they're, in some ways, you know, when the Beijing Olympics were in China, the, the next year the World Expo was in Shanghai, and China was much more interested in that because 85 million people came over the course of six months to see 100 and whatever countries um, sort of strut their stuff. So in this world that started in 1852 in London, um, for the first time ever, the theme of the entire expo is food in uh, 2015 in Milan. So every country, there's 140 participating, is doing a pavilion dedicated to their food and the food system in some way. Obviously, there'll also be all the things that the country stand for. And we, we got word of this. Um, we were like, oh my god, we need to get our hands on that. And I mean, it's a bigger, crazier project than you can ever imagine, uh, but we just thought, if, if our role as an organization is really to, to tell people in the world and celebrate what we know is going on here, which most people outside, except a few in the chef community, and a few people who travel and eat in restaurants all the time, you know, but really to bring the artisans, the enthusiasm, the creativity, the, the ingenuity, the innovation, the, the, food, um, the, the food world, the American food system that we operate in and are proud of, and also the ones we know nothing about but are as innovative as any in the world, 
to America instead of just McDonald's and Coca-Cola and, and Monsanto. Not that they, ha I personally have anything, I mean, I may disagree with them, but obviously they're an important part of the food world also. But if we could control it, maybe it would be a different thing. And somehow we won the bid. <laughs> I don't even know how, because it's much bigger than as organization as we are. And we're producing the American Pavilion for uh, the 2015 Expo. The what happened was the Italians really loved what we proposed and lobbied very heavy in Washington for us to, to make a pavilion that they wanted to see. And we're calling it for obvious reasons, uh, American Food 2.0. This is the logo of the experience. And starting May 1st, 2015, running through October 31st, um, there will be a pavilion that is a sort of uh, an abstract but physical representation of the farm to table system um, that will have growing on top of it uh, representative crops and, and produce from uh, all 50 states that will take you through a physical experience of the food system as it could be uh, focusing on innovation and all. Um, and, and by innovation, I mean perhaps Google meat in a Petri dish, but also an heirloom tomato grown at scale in some way that is, that is viable. So, I, you know, we're, we're taking a very diverse and broad approach. Um, and also, we'll celebrate sort of the best part, the fun parts, like your lunch today. There'll be a huge food truck um, component, and we're going to have a national search for the ambassadors to represent us. They're going to do a caravan through Europe and arrive for the opening in Milan on May 1st, and they'll be operating. Uh, actually, the city of Milan wants the food trucks in the streets of Milan also. So, so we're trying to bring the fun, the, the seriousness, the, the global vision that, that we know it, we have that the rest of the world might not. So it's an incredible project. It's an insane project. And, and a lot of fun things are going on with it. It looks like this is, as, a, as a vision of what it will be. That's a vertical farm, and the, the roof is open. It changes from time to time, but, but basically that's, that's what we're, we're talking about. Uh, and we hope we'll all see you, and that mostly we hope that, and we want to engage as many people as possible. There'll be a big social media piece. There'll be a big um, participation. We want to bring the actual, this moment in time to Milan um, into the pavilion itself, and, and then also stretch the conversations before, after, during, and after about the things we're talking about. But so you'll hear from us, and you'll hear about it. There's a whole protocol about why you don't know what I'm talking about yet. Um, but that'll that'll happen soon. And uh, and yeah, and and for us as an organization, really, what we're trying to do is to find a way to bring what everyone, what you are doing here, what they're doing in Portland, what they're doing in towns I don't even know the names of, um, and show this diverse, responsible face of American food um, that is delicious and fun and really, we think, has a unique um, gastronomic, political, social, um, and even economic and sort of entrepreneurial um, contribution to the conversations of all 139 other countries. And that is my talk. So, uh, questions? We have some time, I think. Sure. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah, sorry. Uh, quick question about uh, the pavilion. Are you taking like micro brewers and micro distillers as well? Uh, yeah, it's funny. What? Uh, the question was whether we are taking microbrewers and micro distillers as well. We want to have their products. There are some logistic complications. Um, the head of the Craft Brewers Association was really eager for us to put in a, a brewery and have a different brewer every week producing something, which I think they're doing at the German Pavilion. The Germans are the biggest pavilion, and they're always the most attended, and they are the first on board. I don't think we actually have the space, but we will certainly represent American craft beers in some way in the pavilion, as we will. There, the Italian government has give, been given special dispensation to bring in products that aren't even allowed in the EU, meat and stuff like that. I mean, they tell us when, when we're standing at customs and they won't let anything in. it would probably be another story, but, but the, so because they want these to be representative things, so I hope that we're going to have with us all that's all all the yummy things we got uh, 10 years ago authenticity was the big buzzword in food, and then there was an incredible backlash against that now we're talking about trends and, and sort of seeing a backlash to that a little bit with the, with the broccoli thing and, and all that. are we moving back towards where we're going to be talking about the authentic experience again like, is it going to be cyclical uh it's, it's, that's a really excellent point, and it's authenticity, I think, as, uh, the question is whether or not, uh, sorry, <laughs> for our home audience, um, the question is whether, you know, 10 years ago, authenticity was an important topic or trend in food, and we've just, uh, we've left it, and people are talking about other things, and is there a tendency, does he do, I think, to come back to some notion of authenticity? Um, my hope, and what I feel like I am experiencing right now, is we've gone beyond a notion of authenticity, which always, I mean, the, the reason it was an interesting topic in the past was because no one, everyone thought it wasn't there, it was an 
aspiration, but no one could pinpoint it. Um, and in reality, especially, it's usually used in um, the context of, um, you know, foods from different food cultures and how they're represented. And one of the things I've written a lot about, actually, is that New York City um, is uh, considered the city of this great, authentic, ethnic food. And actually, that, that does not exist. I mean, A, I don't know that that's a desirable um, aspiration, but it doesn't even really exist. I, I spend a lot of time in Italy and in Japan, and we are fortunate to have amazing Italian food and amazing Japanese food. Uh, none of my Italian or Japanese people rec recognize them as authentic, and the ones that they do, no one in New York even likes. You know, like if you want to open an authentic Italian restaurant, uh, Trattoria, you need to put really bright fluorescent lights, have a football game playing, have kids in, you know, you just couldn't do that. That restaurant could not exist in New York. And the ones that are like that, it just, just, just happened with some of the Florentine friends. You take some of like, why are we eating here? Like, what, what's this about? It's like, this feels like a restaurant in Italy. You just don't want it, you know? And so, so what authentic is is a really difficult thing and, and authentic to what and all that sort of thing. What I think we've moved on to, though, is, and this, this to me is part of the end result of that notion of connoisseurship and using taste or, or, or um, an appreciation of, of, of differences and details, is I think we've moved on to a notion of authenticity, I hope, um, that it's about the, the unique experience we're having in that moment, that, that there's something authentic about the intent of the chef of the restaurant, that it isn't trying to mimic or copy or redo or reinvent. Um, and, and right now, it's funny, there's this trend in New York of Mexican restaurants that are Latin, I would say, not even Mexican, that have no um, aspirations to be authentic to anything. I'm thinking of ABC Cocina, Ampelon Cocina. There's a new one, Stephen Starr is opening, I think. And they're amazing. They are so popular. No one's even, no one's dared say this is not a carne asada taco from a truck in Mexico City because it's not the point. So I'm hoping we've moved beyond that. In some ways, I think David Chang is the, is the um, and the Mamafuku group it might be the spokesperson for that movement, that authentic is about the intent of this thing that I'm making, not about whether or not this is my grandmother's kimchi pork um, jjigae. Uh, I, I don't think that's, I, I'm hoping we're beyond that. And I think once we get beyond that, then we're going to find out what American cuisine might be, but actually really be the unique contribution we have. One of our, one of the propositions that we keep saying in our meetings about Expo, because we, in addition to producing the damn thing, we have to raise all the money, which is the hardest part. Um, so if anyone has $60 million they're looking to throw into this project, I'll take that. Um, <laughs> uh, as long as you can be vetted by the State Department, which is another complication. Uh, but it, uh, it, um, so one of the things that, you, that we keep saying is of all, so there's 140 countries, we were the last to agree to participate, which is uh, typical, I would say. Uh, and uh, one of the unique propositions we hope to communicate is that of all of the pavilions there, we might be the only one in which all other 139 communities, cultures, nationalities could find themselves represented, either in the food or in the cultures or in some way. And to celebrate that, not to say we're better than the French food in France or the Taiwanese food in Taipei or whatever, but actually that, that you somehow we've woven you into this thing in America, American food in this instance, but American culture, and that you'll find resonances of yourself there. And to me, that's a much more exciting gastronomic proposition as well as social and whatever than finding uh, the best authentic blah 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 um, which I just it's just an impossibility you know it's funny well anyway yeah Talk. Yeah, but, I mean, how do you break down you know the differences between uh, a fad a trend and a movement and <laughs> how should we think about where we are with food the whole farm the table what exactly is it what should it be you know what I mean? And yeah. Do things move between those? So the question is, how do you figure anything out, really? Uh, how do you, what's the difference between a fad, a trend? You know, what what do what sticks? What what do we try to get behind? Um, I mean, I think like anything, you really, I, I mean, it's different. Obviously, as, an, as educators, you need to be aware of what's happening. But really, you know, you don't exactly need to prepare students for today. You need to prepare them for tomorrow. So whatever the trend is when one graduates, let's say, uh, I, and I know you didn't ask the question this way, um, isn't the impact that person is going to have, they're going to have that impact in 10 years or in 12, 15 years, presumably. And so to me, I mean, I think that was what the popularity of Escoffier's codification of French cuisine was, it gave someone a, a base to teach on and from. And what do you do when the world is full of kimchi tacos and, and uh, I don't know, deep fried pork 
legs and other, like where do you even begin to instruct anything? And I do think we still need some base, and I I, I don't think we have that yet, but um, but I, I I do think that that to focus on the authenticity of an intent or to instill people to to um, you, you know well, let's look at modernist cuisine, which couldn't have been the could be perhaps the most um, um, what's the word manufactured trend of a of a of our recent times you know and as quickly as it came it sort of receded i mean you know Andrea might say something else about that but but and by receded, I mean it didn't go away. In fact, there are more uh, immersion circulators and sous vide machines now in restaurants probably than there ever were at the height of the trend of modernist cuisine. But but you pick and choose some things that stick that help improve, you know, what we're trying to do with food. And and I think you you always need that level of crazy invention, um, you know, which is as much about a personality as it is about a moment or a, a, the product of a time. I, I always had this image that Ferran Adria at Albuli could have been cooking in, in um, you know, 1820 or 1930. Like, it wasn't about now. It was about some unique vision. He had the technologies of now, but, but you know, when you go to Barcelona and you see Gaudi's architecture, it doesn't look like it's from 1890s. It just looks like it's from some other mind. And in some ways, that takes us there. And so, I, I mean, I'm not giving you a, a satisfying answer, I realize, but I think that we need to, we need to focus in on the intent of the actor, the, the agency of the person doing the food or doing the, the restaurant or the hospitality or the experience and encourage them to, to take in but not just spit out. I mean, duh, but, but to, to really get behind the, the obvious points. What, what people remember about food and meals it, obviously, it tastes good. Did it make them feel good? Did did the environment um, encourage an appreciation or a satisfaction in that experience? And that happens standing in the rain at a food truck, and it happens in a three-star restaurant. And the opposite is also true. And so, somehow, to me, I think, I think you need to teach people to be aware, to look for trends. To you need to see what's coming, but you also have to understand that that we are just here to, in some ways, make dinner and make lunch and 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 move on. So. I don't know. The answer is I don't know. <laughs> the answer to that question, yeah, but it, it's very complicated. But I do think, I mean, I, I actually, we are asked this all the time, you know, what is American cuisine? Is there American cuisine? And I don't, I don't think there really is. I actually, I think that question is a French question. Like, what, is there an American cuisine? You are, you are presuming there will be some codified, recognizable body of, of food and recipes and things that we'll all agree on that is, that is an un-American approach to anything, really. That's a French approach. They started writing encyclopedias to, to codify the entire universe in the 1530s um, and continue to try to do that. And so the question is, what is American cuisine, to me, is, is asking, is, is there French cuisine? in America or something. It's just a French question. You know, to ask, as, as Beard posed the question, is like, is there an American attitude toward food? I think that's a much more American question. We are about attitudes and opinions and personal relationships to things. And I can't imagine we will ever have a body of, of, of recipes we all agree on. It's just not our makeup. We are about a disagreeing and, and the freedom to do that and to say, well, if you're going to do it this way, I'm going to do it this way and screw you. Um, and so... I think, I think you know, this moving past a representation of authentic things from a certain place in a certain time is one step to finding our American food identity or really solidifying something. I think it takes time. France has had 300 years, 250 years. I think we need some, we do things quickly, but we need some time um, and we'll figure it out. But, so it's a little bit of a different... Well, I, I, I think you all already described American cuisine. How? Oh. It's an it's an it's an American approach to cooking, mm. you know, and it's a it's a, it's it's disagreement, it's uh, synthesis, it's uh, uh, the 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 notion that you just do what you want to do as long as it tastes good and people want to eat it, you keep right. doing it. Right, actually, not, there is no business is part of it, has to be part of it. The saleability of, I mean, yes, the customer role in that is part of American cuisine, certainly. Yeah. Maybe last question. Yeah, last question, or not. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Sure.